Good evening and welcome to the Ombudsman's Office. My name is Diane Wellborn and I am the Ombudsman and I will be your host for this evening's program. Uh, we have a very exciting but full program this evening uh, featuring the Department of Planning, Neighborhoods and Development and their, um, their activities which are quite expansive. And we also want to talk about the American Rescue Plan Act for Dayton. I know both of these topics are of great concern for all of the viewers that are watching us this evening. So I'd like to begin by introducing Todd Kinsky, who's the Director of uh, Planning, Neighborhoods and Development at the City of Dayton. And we also have with us tonight, Melissa Wilson, who is with the City of Dayton, uh, is a City of Dayton purchasing agent and is gonna have great responsibility for the American Rescue Plan Act for Dayton. So Todd, I'd like to begin with you, please, and ask if you can give us just a brief overview of your department. We'll come back to its different divisions so that viewers can appreciate more exactly what goes in the divisions, but just kind of the overall mission of the department to start, please. Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for inviting me this evening. Um, <clears throat> So this department is, is a fairly large department, uh, but, and we have a kind of a vast um, array of responsibilities, but mostly we're linked to uh, things related to development uh, from the beginning to end, everything from economic incentives to issuing building permits, going through the land use process, um, and then engaging the community um, in that process so they're, so they're aware of what's going on. Uh, so it, it's really hard to describe it in one mission statement, but, it's really about improving the quality of life and being uh, and coordinating the development process for the city. Good, thank you very much. It's no, no small tasks there, that's for sure. Melissa, please give us, if you can, a brief overview uh, of your role with the American Rescue Plan Act for Dayton. And we will come back, as you know, uh, later in the program to go over many of the details and ways that uh, that citizens and viewers tonight can become involved and inform themselves even further. Please. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the show this evening. I do appreciate it. I am one of a um, small internal group made up of a couple of departments that are helping with the oversight of the American Rescue Plan for the city of Dayton. Um, in conjunction, we've onboarded uh, two consultants to help us facilitate that. So we are a, a uh, advisory group to the city manager to help facilitate ARPA on behalf of the city of Dayton. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I'm sure you're uh, getting into full swing. Um, Todd, why don't you inform our viewers about the merger of the various uh, departments that produced um, your current department as it is now configured? Okay, sure. Uh, so the merger, which happened uh, near the end of June, was uh, the former uh, Planning and Community Development Department and the Economic Development Department. Um, we not only merged departments, but we did some reorganization along the way. Um, and the, the, main, the main focus there uh, was really about, first of all, right-sizing the organization. As you know, um, the city of Dayton, you know, used to have a much larger government structure in this over time. We're just trying to get things to fit right with the uh, with the needs of the city, and it was really also about better coordination of you know related work. Uh, sometimes you know government is um, accused of like every doing everything in a silo, and we don't do that in Dayton. But this is really helpful to have better coordination. Um, the other thing we're really focused on is trying to have a much stronger role in, in neighborhood economic development. As you know, the city has been focused really heavily in downtown and in our job centers. And we're really trying to develop a robust strategy for neighborhood investment. We felt like we could do a better job with that if we were, if our economic development team and our community development team were working closer together. And then lastly, one of the main things that we really wanted to create out of this was the creation of a new community engagement division. As you know, the city uh, you know, has a rich history of community engagement. Back when we had a lot more money and whether and federal grants were a lot larger um and so we're really trying to just build a, a, a more robust community engagement division so uh that was really the focus of the merger 
Um, and, and now we have a department that has an overall budget of around $10 million and um, approximately 100 employees. Okay, very, very good. And um, and this took place back in June, did you say? Has it gone rather smoothly? Yeah, somewhat, yeah. yeah I would say it's gone smoothly. Um, yeah, um, we created some new positions, so we're slowly filling those. Um, you know, it takes a little time. This is the job market is, as you know, has been very challenging. And so we've, uh, you know, finding the right people and the right, you know, the right talent to do the jobs. Um, sometimes it takes a little, little time to get that, get that together, but, uh, uh, it's coming together and we're just, we had kind of have a, an overall, um, implementation schedule we're working towards and we're right on schedule. So things are going well. Um, I think we're already reaping benefits, uh, internally with coordination amongst uh, departments and divisions. Um, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that as soon as our community engagement team is more, um, uh, um, uh, full and we have folks working, uh, then the community will start to see that as well. Very happy to report. We got a couple of, I think our first uh, two employees in the community engagement division are being uh, start next week. Um, and so uh, if you know, I'm sure you know Verletta Jackson, who's been with the city for a long, long time. So this is, she's get two, two new team members beginning on Monday. And when it's all done, she'll have uh, seven people on her team. So we're really excited about that. Well, that's wonderful. I know that uh, Verletta Jackson must be thrilled uh, to have that kind of help coming on. And maybe we'll just have to have that team back on DATV so that the community can meet them all at once. Um, that's one idea for the future. She's um, been wearing I, a smile. She's been wearing a smile every day. I'm you can so ask Melissa. She's, she's very happy. I'm so happy about that. That's wonderful. It's good to know. Um, there's so your your department touches so many of the lives of people in the uh, in the city of Dayton. Um, I I want to take a minute for you to just describe your different divisions. Well, actually, sorry, it's going to take more than a minute. But if you could um, uh, divide, uh, describe some of your different uh, divisions that you have, um, so that the viewers can know what goes on where it's all in one department but it has different divisions and i yes. think that would be helpful it's always helpful when people understand what city government looks like yeah absolutely yeah so um we now uh have six divisions um we're kind of divided up almost evenly between folks who work in city hall and folks who work in the one-stop center um i'll start over at the one-stop center um so we have our building services, so that's all the permitting. So anything you're gonna build, um, you, you know, you have to go through 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 them for you know review and approval. Uh, uh, then we have our housing division, which obviously deals with um, housing violations, um, does boarding of vacant properties, and of course demolition is part of that operation as well. Um, <clears throat> and also zoning enforcement is wrapped up in that in that as well. And then lastly is the is the Dayton Mediation Center, um, and they deal with you know a myriad of, of issues, trying to diffuse situations and find another alternative than uh, than folks going to court. And they help from everything from juvenile mediation to helping folks who may be looking uh, to to avoid divorce. And so it's it kind of runs the gamut. Um, uh, over in City Hall, <clears throat> we have our planning division. So the planning division does um, things like neighborhood plans. Uh, they review any any land use case, something that needs to go to the Landmarks Commission for approval, uh, someone who needs a, a zoning variance. Um, so that, that's all the land development, uh, uh, you know, operations. And then we have our new community engagement division, which I've already described to some degree. Um, and the one very interesting component there is that we have uh, merged our welcome Dayton operations into this community engagement division. And so um, Verletta's team is going to be tasked with, um, you know, looking at how we engage the community, whether it's uh, issues, you know, or, or programs that are coming from the city manager's office, out of the city commission, um, you know, or just whatever, you know, whatever, you know, we have going on in the city, it's really trying to create that connection from city hall out into the neighborhoods. And then lastly is our development division, which is, um, is a new division, but it's uh, the merger of, of two separate work groups. 
the one, it, it's our community development uh, division, you know, old community development division, which is all of our HUD funding, our CDBG and home funding. Um, and there's a few other grants that they administer. So it's largely federal um, funding that we get that they manage. And then it's our, our, um, our economic development functions. So there's, there are two kind of work groups under one umbrella and, uh, and, the, and the economic development group, you know, does everything from business retention to economic development incentives uh, to helping, um, you know, projects move along. And they're a real good partner with our planning division. Um, as we do neighborhood plans, you know, we're trying to marry that up with economic development uh, possibilities. So that's, that's a quick overview of the, of the, six, uh, the six divisions. Oh, well, that's all. It's very exciting, and it's good to hear about some of the mergers and the uh, the new initiatives that are coming out of your department. It's it's an exciting time to know about that. Uh, you mentioned in your opening about economic development in the neighborhoods uh, or community development in the neighborhoods, and it'll it'll be fun to kind of come back to that. And I want the, the viewers to know too that when we get uh, later into the program. We have some of the survey uh, responses that many viewers may have taken part in, and actually many of those kind of touch on parts of your department there. So we'll have an opportunity to come back to that a little bit more um, in depth. Um, but I'd like to um, ask Melissa if you could give uh, an introduction to the American Rescue Plan Act for um, actually, if you wouldn't mind starting with the whole plan, uh, just a brief overview because it's pretty massive. Uh, we're we're rescuing um, we're rescuing ourselves, and uh, and then there's a specific plan uh, here uh, for Dayton. So um, for those that haven't been able to read through the volumes of material and legislations that have all come out about this, maybe you could uh, boil it down um, so that people leave this program with a much better understanding. I'd be happy to. So I think that it's very important that we kind of talk about the CARES funding that we saw come into the city last year. So that funding was set up on those same guidelines, except it was just a reaction to the pandemic to make sure everybody got the goods and supplies that they needed just to make it through the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan funding is set to help communities recover moving forward. It's a forward looking to create more long lasting and positive outcomes to combat the negative impacts of COVID-19 in our communities and in our in our businesses, in our, in our people. Um, and that's one of the big things that I really want people to take away is the first one was reactionary and the second, this one that we're in now is, is planning. It's to make the future better. Um, the city was uh, considered a metropolitan city. So there was different awards and it was all based off of um, the federal guidelines on how they award uh, CDBG and HUD funding. So it's a, it's a formula at the federal level and that was how it was determined how much money the city would receive. Um, we were awarded $138 million and we received it in two separate tranches. So we received the first in May of this year and we'll receive the second portion of it um, about the same time next year. Um, and the, the whole point of the funding is um, that we want to make sure that we're supporting the public health response, we're responding to the negative economic impacts from COVID-19, both in our community and our businesses. And then um, what's really cool about this funding is that it focuses on things um, that traditional federal funding doesn't always point out. And that is serving the hardest hit communities and families that have historically um, underserved and, and underhelped and then focus on black and brown businesses. Okay. And how does our grant award compare with uh, communities around us to the extent that you may know? Um, so we were, um, like I was saying, we are a metropolitan city, so 250,000 population um, or less, um, but we uh, received a direct allocation. A lot of our local communities are receiving allocations through the state or through the county because the county was a recipient um, of funding as well. Um, but it's based on the population size, and that's why the city was able to be a direct recipient uh, in this case. Okay, thank you. And do you know uh, about how much funding is coming across into Ohio from this? 
Unfortunately, I don't have that number, but that is a okay. number that we could get. Um, it's I'm sure it's on the state's website, um, but we can get that number for you as well, a that, follow up. That, that's okay, just just to follow up in the end, that's all right. Uh, you mentioned some of the uh, uh, general f uh, primary focus areas, I should say, and, and Todd, you're welcome, of course, to jump in here at, at any time when you have something to add, because these are your, these are, these are in your department as well. So uh, the first one that I saw listed there was neighborhoods, and we all in the city of Dayton, we all live in our neighborhoods, and we're all proud of our neighborhoods. So uh, let's take a little time about uh, what, what the hopes are for the neighborhoods with this. Sure. So the city has focused historically a lot, and in, in the most recent, at the downtown area. And this funding is really geared to helping our neighborhoods grow um, and thrive in spots. So this isn't going to fix everything. This is a starting point for a lot of our neighborhoods. Um, the city manager likened it to the peanut butter approach. If you spread it real thin, you're only getting a little bit of peanut butter. But if you can concentrate it in certain spots, you get a good helping and then you can add on to it later. Um, there are several uh, areas and neighborhoods just happen to be one of them that is a continual focus from um, I'm sorry, my young one just came in. Um, okay. Continuous focus um, from the city. Uh, and neighborhoods is a generality. So I want to say first that these categories are kind of a, they were a generality to help us organize our funding and, and how we were going to go about doing it. Um, and so these are kind of like, we call them buckets, large buckets to help figure out how to, to look at projects. Todd, do you want to add anything to that portion? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so I think Melissa's right on the the focus and you know is really on neighborhoods, and uh, I would just add two really important uh, points here. One is we're making data driven decisions, so we have to make sure that we are following the data and we're and we're we're spending the money where it needs to be spent. As I say to people all the time, if you don't use data to make your decisions, then it seems arbitrary, and we just cannot do that. Secondly. The, a real focus um, of the city and really influenced by the city manager is this notion of leveraging. Um, so we're looking at projects where we can potentially leverage. Um, so as you know, there is an external process, uh, application process, which is going on right now. Um, and if we have uh, an external partner who is coming forward with a, with an idea and they're going to spend some of their money, then then city's money with leveraging that and having a bigger impact is, is a goal. But we're also looking at, you know, where can we take existing resources, whether it's issue, you know, the issue nine money, whether it's current general fund money, CDBG funding. And so we're really trying to like, you know, make a big impact so that we're really having a transformational effect uh, on, on some neighborhoods. So we're still figuring that we're, we're working through the data um, and uh, and we're going to do everything we can to leverage so that, you know, we don't spend this money and then everyone says, well, what did you do? You know, we really want to make a, a difference. Um, and uh, and that's the challenge, um, because one hundred thirty eight million dollars sounds like a lot of money until you start spending it. Uh, you know, we have one road project, you know, Salem Avenue, that's $5 million. You know, it's like you start thinking about it in those terms, you know, it, it doesn't go that far. So this is why we can't just like go out and just spend our money. We have to leverage everyone else's money. So the impact is is two, three, four, five times the one than just the $138 million. And I think it's also important to say here that, you know, the city takes the, the stance that one-time funding is one-time expenditure. So you don't want to create new programs when it's only a one-time source of funding. And so we're very cognizant of that going forward. And that's, it was also written in the notice of funding opportunities for that same purpose. Um, because if it's not sustainable, you don't want to necessarily invest in it and miss out on investing in something else that is sustainable. Okay, thank you both for, for those answers. We're gonna come back to some of these priorities, but we have a question in the chat that I will just share with uh, the viewers and with the two of you. Uh, there's a question about the community engagement program and mm -hmm. will the new staff members of the city of Dayton be coming out and talking with the different communities? 
Okay. In short, I think the answer is yes. The exact strategy is still being, uh, you know, looked at pretty hard. Uh, one of the approaches that we are are considering is a geographic focus. So in certain geographies, they would have a key, you know, contact person. Um, and so uh, we're working through those details. But um, now I will say that if a person's hired on money and they're not coming out the next day to the neighborhood, uh, you know, we got to get them on board and, and, and develop the work program. But uh, that's the whole goal. The goal is to be able to get neighborhoods connected to City Hall. Um, and so I know that Verletta has been stretched pretty thin trying to get to every you know, event going on in the neighborhoods. So she will have some backup really soon. Um, and, but I just can't comment on the exact, you know, kind of deployment uh, date right now, but um, but you will definitely be seeing more uh, of, of my staff. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Let's, uh, we, we spoke a bit about neighborhoods. Um, I'm not sure if you want to go through each one of these with uh, amenities and major catalytic projects and community investments and external awards. But let's touch on each of them so our viewers have a sense for what what is being talked about uh, when we talk about those types of projects. Sure, and this is, I want to put all, um, that this is all out there on the city's ARPA webpage. Um, so it'll be good reference and follow up later for viewers. Um, and I'll, we can provide that website to you, um, but neighborhoods are city-led and managed projects that would support like healthier lifestyles and through neighborhood revitalization efforts. Um, your amenities are more projects and investments that provide rec recreational and lifestyle um, assets to the community. So you're talking about your parks and your, your sidewalks and those types of things. Um, major catalytic projects are set up to address economic disparities and um, and sent additional economic develop and development activity in your in your communities. Uh, broadband would fall under this category, which is one of the things allowable by the ARPA guidelines. Um, city projects, um, that's just more of an internal investment that supports city services that therefore help the communities. So investment in a planning uh, area that would help a neighborhood program. Um, community investments are community driven projects. So what are, you know, our nonprofits, you know, that's what we're looking for them through this um, application opportunity that, that we have out there right now, where they know what we need, they know where the hardest hit economic areas are, um, they have the beat in the community. So that's really what we're looking for and feedback from them and their ideas. Um, and then external awards. So this is more focused on the small business, um, hospitality industry, and this is supporting vulnerable economic sectors that might not survive again it should something like a pandemic hit um travel and tourism is one that's very highly talked about in the in the arpa federal guidance um but also to help address the health emergency um, and that's a really quick overview but there are so many opportunities in each of these categories um the u.s treasury guidance the interim guidance because we've not yet received the final um is 151 pages of super fun reading um, if you're, if you're really tired, uh, you know, I'm just kidding. Uh, but it, it's broad in some areas and narrow focus in others. So we try to take, pull out all those important elements and put a definition to them. So they're more tangible for people to understand. Uh, that's a, that's a, a good plan. Um, what is the, um, what's the time frame? You mentioned the first half or first part of the money had arrived, second part to arrive next May. Mm -hmm. uh, when is all this supposed to be uh, completed? When are the funds need to be obligated? Um, according, according to the guidelines, all of the funds have to be encumbered or put into a contract or like vehicle by December 31st, 2024 and everything needs to be completed by December 31st, 2026. And that includes any kind of construction. And then, then there's the project cleanup side of it. So there's a very tight time frame. If there's um, long-term projects, we're trying to go and, and figure out the plan early. So there's time to give them time to complete it. Okay. And then um, something that, uh, that has uh, come up with me while at we're discussing this this evening seems like communities across the country are all 
embarking and to use these rescue funds. Is there much communication among cities on who's doing what, or is each city inventing kind of their own wheel, given the 150 pages of, of uh, gui guidelines uh, that come out about it? I think that um, it's probably a little bit of both, to be honest with you. The U.S. Conference of Mayors has um, had a lot of conversation with multiple city participation um, to help develop some of the parameters, to ask some of the questions, to clarify some of the details that, that seem a little vague in the guidance. Um, I know that we've, uh, our, through our consultant, um, they're working with some other cities uh, that are also using funding. So it's kind of a checks and balance, does this make sense? But a lot of it depends on your, organ your community and what are your community needs? And that's really the focus of the ARPA funding is on your individual community. Um, which is also another reason why the city um, helped or uh, was named one of the stimulus command centers. And that's another focus for the city to use our partners in the region to help facilitate even more impact through this funding. Okay. Todd, did you have something you wanted to add on that? Well, yeah, I, I was just, I was just going to say that I think the, the difference that I have uh, ex uh based on some communicate I was on a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago and I've talked to a few folks around the state and I would say what differentiates Dayton is the process we're using for input um, some cities have just unilaterally said we're just spending it on this you know and it's straightforward whether it's a personnel cost or, or something along those lines and I think Dayton is taking uh, this one time um, huge increase uh, of funding uh, very, very seriously and trying to make the, the biggest impact that we possibly can. Um, so um, that to me is a, I, I've been pleased with that. You know, planners, which I am, I'm a planner, are all about community input. And, um, and I've been really surprised quite frankly with some of the cities and the approach that they've taken in terms of uh, how they've decided to spend the money. So. I think that I think not only are we doing a good job, I think the community is doing an amazing job responding. Um, you know, we've had lots of folks who responded to the survey work and um, and uh, I'm sorry, the survey and then all of the community meetings, you know, they've been, as Melissa knows, well attended and we're receiving lots of uh, lots of input from folks. It's funny, Todd, that you say that. I was the consultant was just talking with us uh, earlier that, or late last week in saying that Dayton by far has done the most community outreach and is actually um, the place that a lot of the local cities are looking at, at for ideas on how to help with community involvement in the fund, in the spending of the funding. Well, and Diane, I think another really important thing to understand for for the viewers out there is that um, we. So uh, Melissa referred to the regulations. Um, they've issued the regulations that were issued in July. They were called the interim final rule or was in June. I can't remember now. Um, too, July. Long, too long ago. June. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. June. And um, and so there's been a lot of influencing going on trying to like as, as Melissa mentioned through the U.S. Conference of Mayors and others are trying to influence the outcome so that the, the, the money is much more flexible. Because there are certainly things that are, were prioritized by residents in the survey that are currently not permissible. And so we have been pushing really hard for that. And that's why at this point, we haven't, I don't want to speak for Melissa, but we haven't narrowed what you can request or what you can propose until we really know what the final rule is. And, and you know, if it, it, it can't be issued soon enough. Um, so that will, that will unfortunately, depending on what it says and how and how flexible it is it's going to you know there are going to be programs that you know we are going to finally know if they're permitted or not um so we're anxiously awaiting that so that is a that is a big wrinkle on this thing that that is mm -hmm. unusual oh yes definitely so because um you know with all federal money that comes down there are restrictions and so it's important to know what the guidelines and what the rules are before you, you jump into it. And sometimes they're very slow in getting that getting that part of it out. Is there uh, an expected date? I mean, sometimes they don't even do that for us. They don't even give us the hope of a date. I see Melissa laughing there. <laughs> they said fall. 
They told us fall of this Oh, that's year. nice. Okay. That's a nice, big, wide birth of time. Okay. Well, we were just talking about the participation in, uh, in the, in the uh, community uh, to this. And um, I just wondered if, if you all uh, shared my sense that the community was eager to do this, that they've been waiting for an opportunity to be asked and to give input. I wondered if either of you would want to comment on that. Sure. So through the, as Todd, you know, spoke about, we've done a lot of community outreach and, and in these sessions, there has been a, a wonderful response from our community and asking more questions and, and, you know, really trying to get down to what is the funding for and how can it help the community? And um, I think that they want to be heard. The community wants to be heard. And this is an excellent opportunity, a vehicle for them to really give us their ideas and to give us their projects and and for us to really have an opportunity to look through all of that and as Todd said earlier also leverage them who can we partner together how can we make this a very long-term and robust uh impact for our neighborhoods as a great starting point so well let's uh let's then turn to um the participation as we see it in the responses uh, to the surveys um, and uh, and uh, the survey responses. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So if the staff at DATV could please show the slide that is labeled overall responses. Uh, and Todd, you and Melissa are gonna know what's coming up. I want to start even with an apology uh, for, to the viewers because this may not be able to be read very clearly on the screens that we have, no fault of DATV, it's just that it's a very dense, uh, it's a very dense um, uh, survey report, which is, which is excellent. Um, but I want them, I want people to be able to, to see that and the viewers can now see it. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, Todd or Melissa, whichever one of you wants to start first. I mean, certain bars really jump out as being uh, significantly higher, meaning more, uh, more responses favoring those than others. Would you like to hit some of the highlights of this for the viewers while it's live in front of them? Sure, I'd be happy to. So first of all, this wasn't a forced choice survey, so I want to make that clear. They didn't have to choose one um, or the other. They could choose very important or not important or somewhere in between for every question. So that's important to know. Um, we had 17, a little over 1,700 responses, which is absolutely phenomenal. And this came from both our online survey and our seven community meetings. Um, and so the survey shows you the demolition is probably the highest uh, ranked or notif noticeably uh, interested topic for our community, um, followed closely by housing. That's another big topic. Um, and none of, I don't think any of these came to a real big surprise to the city. They're ongoing uh, topics for us. Um, funding to address crime in the built environment. So not new projects or new programs, but what are we doing now? And then supporting a black and brown businesses, which is really in the heart of the ARPA funding. Um, all the rest of them are fault. They're all really close. So I think the city was um, good on the right path in regards to knowing kind of the beat, but this survey really helps um, enforce that. Yes, these are important topics for the community. Okay, Todd, did you want to add anything to that review or overview? No, I, I would just say that uh, I wasn't surprised by the responses. So okay. I, I think uh, it made me feel good as a, as a public servant. You think you understand the uh, the needs uh, and uh, wishes of the community. And then when they're validated, that, that's certainly helpful. So again, I wasn't surprised. Okay, that's good to know from our um, Director of Planning, Neighborhoods and Development that you weren't surprised by that. Um, thank you. And so uh, could I ask again, uh, the staff at DATV if they could uh, put up the uh, pie uh, shaped uh, response that is a response to open ended responses on certain themes, if they could put that up then we can uh, ask both Melissa and Todd to give us a word about these categories and, and what they got 
from folks there. I believe that is live, so go ahead and take it away. Perfect. So we received um, a little over 19 or 1,197 comments. Those are written comments where folks could give us what they what they thought, and you can actually read them verbatim um, by going to the website and clicking on the link. But what we did is kind of a word count, to see what words popped up the most. And that's the pie chart that you're seeing right now. So again, housing, parks, um, downtown, safety, infrastructure. These are all really hot topics in general. A lot of issue nine focused um, funding areas, a lot of areas that the city does significant investment in and could do more investment in um, that are also uh, ARPA related items. I think that uh, Todd might agree that he's not surprised by the outcomes of some of these terms as well. Um, these are not, in our ongoing everyday conversation. <laughs> Good. Okay. Any anything else on that, or shall we we shall we move a bit forward? Okay. Um, we've we're um, we've been having workshops for individuals and agencies to attend in order to learn um, the parameters of making an application for some of these funds. Uh, which of you all would like to give us an overview of how those have been going? I understand they're almost concluded. I think there is an opportunity. Is, is there an opportunity for one more tomorrow afternoon of, of those initial workshops? Is that correct? Sure. So the workshop portion is concluded. That's where we actually did the presentation of the PowerPoint. There's office hours still available tomorrow via Zoom. Um, and they run from two to four. So make sure to check uh, the website for the most updated uh, link. I know that we've kind of had some issues with our Zoom. So make sure that you go out there and look at the link. But we've added another in-person session because there has been so much request uh, for additional time. And that will be held on Wednesday, October 13th um, from four to six at the Northwest Library. And I know the flyer says four to seven, but the library closes at six. So it'll be from four to six at the Northwest Library. Now that's an important announcement here. I'm, I'm sure it's on the website somewhere, but it's important for people to know that if they missed it somehow or they couldn't get there, that there is still an opportunity to do that where they yes. can uh, learn about uh, making applications uh, for these. How well attended have they been? Oh, it's been phenomenal. Um, I can say that just about every session we filled up a couple of pages. You can see who all has attended and their contact information. Everything is listed out there on the city's uh, ARPA webpage. So we've scanned in all of the attendance for those items. Good. And I also wanted to tell the viewers that the slides that we showed, if it if they needed more time to absorb those, those of course are available on the city's website um, for the ARPA website. Um, part of the uh, of that so people can look at those a little bit longer if we went to uh, too quickly. Um, have you already started receiving applications? Yeah, I think I've gotten notice of a couple initial applications. I don't or starts of applications. I guess I shouldn't say they're really done yet. Um, there is a opportunity for folks to submit their application um, by midnight this Friday to allow the consultant to do an early review to help uh, guide people on maybe where they need to fill out more information or uh, maybe adjust some of their terminology to help make sure that their project is going to be in the eligible realm and have the best opportunity to receive points. Hey, okay. Hey, Diane, I, if Please. I could pop, uh, just say one thing. I think one of the interesting uh, things that we've added, and Melissa can weigh in on this, but you know, one of the challenges with using federal money is typically you need to have, you need, you need to be an organization that has some capacity. Um, yes. And sometimes, you know, you might have a really good idea, but you don't have any way to take, you know, to administer that and follow all the rules. So one of the things that we actually introduced is this idea of just submitting your ideas, you know, mm -hmm. because um, there might be someone who has a fantastic idea, but because they can't fund it or they can't match the funding or they don't, you know, they can't follow all the rules or know all the rules or learn all the rules. Um, and so we really want to get that, uh, solicit that feedback from citizens. And, and I'm, I'm excited to see some of the ideas that, uh, that come in uh, under, under that, uh, that portion of the, of the submittal process. Oh, that's good. Are you able to toss out a few without, um, you know, identifying the groups? Are you able to, uh, give a little a little bit of information about it there 
No, not at this time. Okay. Um, I understand. Um, okay. Uh, well, that's good. That, that's really good. Uh, so there's a there's an kind of early decision or early review process coming up this Friday. Uh, when uh, when is the deadline for these to be in? Sure, the final application deadline is October 29th um, by 5 p.m. and you just submit them on the, it's all electronic, so you go through the application page and it'll walk you step by step. It tells you what documents, it'll give you templates to help upload. Um, we tried to make this as user friendly as possible. Did you require uh, or did you obtain letters of intent or is the application submission going to really be that? The application submission will be the letter of intent. Uh, okay, okay. That, that's that's always good to know. And um, okay, uh, Todd mentioned earlier that the final rules aren't out yet. So what is the thinking about how to handle uh, projects that come in that may be really wonderful but somehow they're not they're not fitting in the rules how how's that to be dealt with well there will be outreach done i believe to the folks that submitted um that let them know if their project was accepted um or if it wasn't eligible uh, and i'd like to give them some feedback on that i don't know that we've gotten all the way through that process um it's still kind of kind of going on um all the details um as we work through this but there will be follow-up for the folks that did submit and hopefully um, we can kind of retain some of those ideas. So should future funding become available with different guidelines, um, we have a good base to start from. And obviously if, you know, if it's an idea in the idea box, the folks that submitted it are the ones that are gonna get credit for the idea. That's good. Todd, did you wanna add anything? I couldn't tell. No, no, I'm just shaking my head. I'm, oh, okay, I'm well that's I mean, good. You're, you're I'm in really agreement. excited. I'm really excited about mm -hmm. this. and. Uh, you know, you know, we actually have a little bit of, you know, so we have some other funding, you know, uh, uh, CDBG, CDBG CARES, uh, some other funding. So if we have a project that comes in and it's a really good project and we can't fund it out of uh, ARPA, we will look at other funding sources if we have some something, some other way to fund it. So good. we're, I mean, we're not making promises that we're going to fund everything, but if there is a logical other funding mm -hmm. source that's available, we would certainly um, pursue that. Well, that that's encouraging to uh, to know that. Now, um, how will the determination um, be made about which applications will be approved? I mean, of course, there's the rules that we've talked about a little bit, and if it just doesn't fall in the permitted area, it just can't happen. But for those that do fall in that area, um, what's the process, and who's going to make this decision? The city um, consultants will first go through and verify eligibility on the projects, and then um, the projects will be provided to the Community Neighborhood Advisory Board, CNDAB. I'm, I'm close, like Todd could correct me on my on my acronym. Um, and they have a group that is set aside to score, and the outcome of that will be a recommendation made to the city manager, which will then be um, combined with um, any other internal projects that have been recommended for community uh, focus and all of that will be presented to the commission and then the commission will make the ultimate decision on what to approve. Okay, would you like to give us a little bit about the timeline for that, which I would point out is also on the website. Um, we don't have to have, you know, specific date and time, but just give us an overview about how this is going to play out during the fall after the after the 20, October 29th date. Todd, did sure. you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to add one thing to Melissa's explanation is that after the plan is pulled together, we're going to go back out to the community to get some feedback before sure. the commission approves it. So I want to just clarify that the community Thank will you. see it before it gets voted on. Okay. That's yeah. a very good point. Thank you for uh, bringing that in. So let's go back to the, just a kind of overview about what's happening this fall. So people can be, you know, listening for it and reading about it in the news or hearing about it. Sure. So for the most uh, of the month of December, the CENDAB, will be reviewing and making the recommendation. And then early December, the city manager will be going back out to the community, as Todd had said, um, to discuss with the community. And then um, December 8th, there'll be a work session. And then the 15th, that's when there'll be a public hearing. And, um, and if so, 
wanted adopted by the commission. And then we will actually do physical awards in the first, first quarter of next year. There just won't be time to do any awards this year. Um, so that'll all happen after we get the final guidance and we can vet through all the details to make sure everything is in accordance with the federal guidance. Yes. So uh, December the 15th is going to be um, the, the public hearing where the, the recommendations are being made about the decisions on all these grants. That's a, that's a key date. That's a, that's a good one. Um, and for planners, how will these projects then down the line be evaluated? You mean uh, in terms of impact? Yes. Or from either uh, one of you, from both of you, because well, I'm sure that's in the guidelines too. Well, yeah. So uh, I will just tell you as someone who administers federal programming, it's all about compliance. So mm -hmm. it's just about following the rules. So as long as they're following the rules and and the project is meeting the goals, um, we'll, we'll deem that successful. Um, but again, in my mind, uh, and I think in the city's mind, the, the more we can leverage and the bigger impact, that will be how we measure success. I mean, it, it's it's a little bit, uh, it's, not, it's, it's not very empirical, but as I said early on, if we spend this money and nobody recognizes a difference in the community, then um, then that's that's the uh, that's the litmus test there on whether or not we we, we did we do what we're supposed to do or not. At least right. in my mind. So. Yes, everybody wants to see uh, the results of that. Uh, you've mentioned leveraging a bit, and uh, we don't have a lot of time left. But how how do you uh, anticipate that the community groups making these applications? will be able to engage in that leveraging? Well, I think that they'll be, if it's their project, they're gonna be key players. Um, it's gonna be more of a partnership approach to those projects because they have the community beat and it may partner with something the city is able to do because of their um, regulation or requirement. Um, you know, community groups cannot do sidewalks, but the city can help do sidewalks. That's just, you know, an example. Um, but I really foresee this as a partnership and um, going forward, you know, looking across the board at, you know, building upon these partnerships with other funding opportunities, as Todd had said. So, okay. And there are um, lots of different areas here that are priority areas. So, um, are there certain types of projects that you all are, are really hoping for? Can you say anything about what's something that, you know, this would really be great or this would really be great, not to the exclusion of anything else, but clearly uh, from the positions that you are in, there are things that that you and your staff would, would have discussed and wanted for our city if there were the money to do X, Y, and Z. Well, I'll comment and I'll see what Melissa has to say. The, the number one thing that I hope gets added to the final rule is is money for demolition um we have there's so many vacant houses still in the city and the, you know we know that when we remove those buildings it it impacts property values it impacts quality of life uh and then the other thing i hope is that we can really um make some differences in some of our housing um folks where people are already living um if we can find a way to invest in those properties either with them as the owner through the landlord through nonprofits that are helping whatever um, that's my personal goal uh, or that I would love to see or wish not a goal wish it's a wish list wish. that's right you got to have a wish list yeah and Melissa did you want to add so I really think the focus um, by the funding on the use of black and brown businesses and helping those um, black and brown businesses grow and succeed and be more ample um, for future is one of the most exciting things I've seen come out of federal funding um, where it's that particular focus. So I really, I'm hoping our community sees that as well and can help us facilitate that and, and just start a movement. Yes, I, I personally would be very surprised if we don't have some really wonderful applications in that regard. Certainly, certainly hope so. Um, okay, we don't have much time left, but I just wanted to give each of you an opportunity to provide any uh, closing closing remarks that you would like to make uh, to the viewers or about this uh, entire enormous project. 
So I would say um, thank you very much again. We are very excited. The city is very excited about this opportunity and looking forward to hearing from our community. Um, www.daytonohio.gov backslash ARPA will give you um, direct access to everything that we talked about today. All the materials are out there. Please check it on a regular basis. It's going to be an ongoing use um, to keep people updated as well. Um, and if you have any questions, it's ARPA-application at DaytonOhio.gov, and we will be happy to, to answer that for you. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Todd? Well, I would just add relative to ARPA that your input is critical. The, the input from businesses, from property owners, from citizens, if you work, play, invest, uh, work, play, live, invest, you know, in Dayton, you know, your voice uh, is of value and want to hear from you. Um, so, it, I mean, this is an unprecedented time in my lifetime where the federal government's giving this huge, uh, uh, huge amount of money in a short period of time. And when you start thinking about this and potential future infrastructure dollars, other funding that's part of the Build Back Better uh, initiative, you know, we have an opportunity here to make some really uh, dramatic changes. And, um, and so we can't do it uh, by ourselves and we can't do it without uh, everyone's ideas and thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And I'm sure the viewers appreciated um, hearing that and all the invitations to participate tonight and throughout the fall as this goes forward. Um, so again, uh, a lot of what we've talked about is detailed on the website. Um, in uh, the application is there. One can look through that and look at all the different categories and where you can upload things. Um, it's, it's interesting, so it'll be a good thing for um, to see those rolling in and to learn uh, how they are being received. So I want to thank Todd Kersky for coming on tonight and Melissa Wilson uh, for being my guest tonight to talk about this and present all this information uh, to the viewers. And uh, uh, if you missed a part of this or came in on the middle of any of it, uh, DATV will be replaying this a couple of times a week. So if you want to tune in, uh, if you want to see it, then you can uh, follow, follow it uh, again. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Goodbye.